And of course, you know, six weeks, it's not really enough time to go through each and every section. Um, but we have uh, uh, hit some of the, certainly the highlights of the early church. Next week, we're going to start a new series in the book of Philippians. Okay, four chapters, four weeks, and it's a series that's going to be on joy. So if you need a little bit of that in your life, you don't want to miss uh, the next four weeks. So, but this weekend, we're finishing Ecclesia. That's Memorial Day weekend. So we're, we're honoring, obviously, those that have served and died for our country. Um, and we remember them and, of course, honor them on Memorial Day, which will be celebrated or recognized tomorrow. Um, it is also Pentecost Sunday. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with some of the early church tradition, we actually studied this a couple weeks back. And so this is when the Holy Spirit was poured out onto the disciples in the upper room there in Jerusalem. And so we celebrate this as Pentecost Sunday, the 40 days or so after Easter um, both instances, we were given an incredible freedom, and I think that's definitely something worth noting. So Memorial Day has always been an interesting time for me, because usually my mind goes to all of the passages in Scripture that talk about memorials, like Joshua is one of my favorites, right? And I've told myself, I'm not going to preach on Joshua this Memorial Day. I'm not going to talk about how they were wandering in the desert and they went through all of these different detours and they finally got to the edge of the Jordan River and then God dried up the Jordan River so they could cross and when they crossed he told them to put 12 stones in the base of the river and they put those 12 stones there as a memorial and then when they crossed the other side God said put another 12 stones here and so your children will come back and your children's children will remember what happened. I'm not going to preach on that today. <laughs> I told myself I'm not going to do it. I need detours going in different places, right? My mind does that, though. I tend to wander down different trails. Sometimes even when I'm talking to you guys, I'll think, oh, wait, God is taking me in this direction. But detours can be fun and good. But, but most of the time, how many like do detours? Let's just look at this as a road perspective. Driving on the road, how many of you like detours? No way. Like, yeah, I love detours, right? Yes, I will embrace the grand adventure of this sign that is sending me somewhere that I don't probably want to go. Detours are, are obviously unexpected, but they're certainly something that happens in life. If you drive around here in the summertime, I would say New York or Pennsylvania, and I've driven for 20 plus years in this part of the country off and on, and can I tell you that this is the land of detours. Yeah. It is the <laughs> land of road work, mostly because the roads get so beat up in the winter that it takes every summer to repair them. But there's so many different things. It will be a nightmare if, in fact, we experienced this driving down to Virginia uh, just a couple weeks ago, all sorts of detours. Now, if we didn't have the coordinates punched into the GPS, we might have been, you know, we would have had some problems because we would have followed these signs. But even then, it was a little bit precarious. But the GPS got us where, got us where we need to go. I think guys are interesting with this, though, because they seem to think they know more than the <laughs> GPS. Now, why do we, I don't know why we do this. But we see, so the GPS says take a right up here. No, 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 I think if we go up one more and take a right, I think I could make better time do that, right? But so now that there's this voice in the GPS now or in your phones that says proceed to the route, right? And guys, you know that voice because you've heard it a lot. Proceed <laughs> to the route. Get back on the route. Stay the course that I gave you to begin with. This is something that, you know, I'm sure we've all heard. Recalculate. Yeah, recalculate. <laughs> so sometimes we set out for a certain destination, and we enter an address, and a GPS calculates the best route uh, and the time it will take us to get to that particular desti destination. Occasionally, we experience these different variables, accidents, weather, road work. Um, these cause us to take unintended detours. Unintended detours in order to get to the place that we want to go. It's not ideal, but the GPS recalculates and gets us to our destination. Life is a lot like that. It's full of a lot of detours. It seldom goes exactly as planned. There's often twists and turns. But did you know that even in the detours of your life, that God is at work? That God is at work and often teaches his best lessons in those detours, those moments that we would otherwise call anxious moments. God is actually working to cure anxiety and move us towards something, his plan, 
and his purpose. So for the past five weeks, we've been getting a bird's eye view of the events of the early church in the book of Acts. The things that have been going on, all the twists and all the turns, all the detours, but we've seen and we know that God has with, been with them every step of the way, including with a guy that we started to look at last week, uh, the Apostle Paul. So if you were here last week, you know, we looked at the Apostle Paul's conversion experience. So the beginning of his faith journey, if you will. Now, like Paul, he, like many of us, Paul would go on to face uh, many God-ordained detours. If you read through the book of Acts, you can see in his missionary journeys, there were things where he wanted to go one way, and the Spirit wouldn't let him go this way, so he would send him another way. There was all sorts of twists and turns and detours. But he continued to run his race and take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now listen, the ends of the earth at that time was Rome. That was about what, if you said, like when Jesus said, go preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, in their mind, this was it. In Paul's mind, for sure, this was it. Rome. So today we're going to finish our study. What we're going to do is we're going to go to the end of the book of Acts, Acts chapter uh, 28, which we have talked about before here in service, I think last year sometime. But I want to, as, as we're studying this book and finishing this book today, I think it's important to give us two bookends and to make sure that we get a full understanding of uh, or a completion of this particular particular book. Um, today we're going to, to um, look at, at this particular uh, passage uh, where Paul is coming into, uh, he's going to come into Rome eventually. Let me just tell you how he gets there, okay? I'll kind of recap it for you since we didn't have the opportunity to go through you know, any of Paul's missionary journeys, but we're going kind of right to the end. Some of you may be familiar, some of you may be not. So I'm just going to give you some probably important points that you might need to know to really understand the passage that we're going to look at today. So earlier in Acts, Paul had been detained in Jerusalem. So if you know anything about Paul or the early Christians, they were preaching the gospel, and oftentimes when they preached the gospel, people got offended, and they would, well, some people got saved. But some people got offended, like the religious leaders, and it would catch them, it would get them into trouble. Um, this was Paul's only crime, right? Was preaching the gospel, was preaching Jesus. And he had requested, as he's standing there in his you know, trial of sorts, he had requested to be uh, that his case be heard by Caesar. This was a pretty bold move, and uh, actually was quite smart by Paul in his uh, saying. Also, he had the ability to do that because he was a Roman citizen. So he appealed to be heard uh, by Caesar. In Acts 23, while Paul is testifying before the Sanhedrin, remember which, that was, which he was actually a member of at one point, so he was testifying before these religious leaders, and a fight breaks out. This is pretty interesting. This is exciting stuff. This is why I want to read this last part to you, because it's just like this adventure of Paul's is incredible, and this is just the beginning of it. And so this fight breaks out because Paul, you know, a Pharisee, he was preaching about hope after death. Now, if you know anything about history, you'll know that the Pharisees did believe in the afterlife. They believe in life after death. But the Sadducees, the other side of this religious group, uh, Jewish group, they did not believe in that same thing. And so when Paul said this, this is, of course, you know, this is... Uh, these, them are fighting words, if you will. And that's exactly what happened. And the Bible said that this dispute was so violent that they had to remove Paul. The centurion Julius removed Paul because they were, they were afraid that he was just not going to make it. And of course, he wasn't going to lose him under his watch. Acts 23, 11 says this. After all this happens in the Sanhedrin there, and Paul's removed, and this big fight is happening, then in Acts 23, 11, this passage says, The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Paul was eager to minister in Rome. He was eager, and prior to his detention in Jerusalem, he actually wrote a letter to the church in Rome. In fact, you might know it. It's called the Book of Romans. And he wrote this letter, and he knew that he was going to go to preach in Rome. He knew that he needed to do this 
because he knew that Rome was the capital of influence for the day. It was said that all roads led to Rome in the ancient world. Well, if all roads lead to it, well, then these, these same roads lead away from it. And so he saw this as an incredible opportunity to preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and to bring people to the knowledge of Jesus and get them saved. And so this is his goal. He's in custody at this point. He's in custody by uh, a man by the name of Julius, a centurion, and he's put on a ship that's bound for uh, Rome, of course. And after a series of maritime detours uh, and a storm called uh, Eurokilo, which is a half Greek, half Latin word, which means uh, wind from the east and the north. You know what that is? An oyster. Yeah, it's an oyster. We know those around here, right? So it's this kind of storm that comes, and he finds himself, there's this incredible shipwreck, and people are floating in the water and holding on to boards, and then finally they find themselves on the island of Malta, about 60 miles south of Sicily. So picture this. He's, he's, under, he's in the court, in the Sanhedrin, then he is on his way to Rome on a boat, right? So he gets in a boat in Caesarea. He's on this boat, and while he's going on this journey, right, they make a few stops along the way. Then there's this massive storm. Then there's this shipwreck. The boat is totally destroyed. Somehow, miraculously, they survive, and they end up 60 miles south on this island called Malta. When they get to the beach, somebody must have said, hey, let's build a fire. And so they start to build a fire, but as they build the fire, a viper comes out of the fire and attaches itself to Paul's arm. Now, that wouldn't be bad enough that it's a snake attaching yourself to, and then he bites Paul on the, this is a viper, a poisonous snake. The people around him are like, surely he's gonna die. But surely he did not, because God, God, God saved him. From that, from imminent death, they're bite, bitten by a poisonous snake. He shakes the snake off into the fire, Scripture says. And then he goes on to meet the governor of that area there in Malta. He does some miraculous signs and wonders. He heals some people. He likely had an opportunity to preach the gospel. And because of these events, he is rewarded. Him and all of the people there were rewarded with provision and they were given what they needed to complete the journey. Let me give you just a visual picture of this journey in all of its detours. So you can see here, where's where he started in Caesarea? And then they went from Caesarea to Sidon and up to Myra and then Fair Havens and all these other places, the island of Crete, right? So you can read in the book of Titus, it's all about the island of Crete. And then he goes up to Malta, which is just south of where his original destination is going, or his uh, destination is going to be up in Rome. We'll talk about the other ones there in a minute. So Malta is Malta is where where he's at at the moment, and that's where we pick up the story in Acts chapter twenty-eight. So Acts chapter twenty-eight, starting in verse eleven. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there or scroll there on your YouVersion app. And in verse eleven, it says this. So remember, this is post shipwreck. In the three months after the shipwreck, that we set sail on another ship, so they had been given provision, this is another ship, that had wintered at the island, an Alexandrian ship with the twin gods as figureheads, in case you're interested in Greek history, that's Pollux and Castor, those were the figureheads on there. Our first stop was Syracuse, we stayed, stayed there three days. From there, I know there's a joke about Syracuse there, but I'm gonna skip it. <laughs> From there, we sailed across to Reguium. A day later, south wind began blowing. So the following day, we sailed across, uh, we sailed up the coast of Petula, where we found some believers who invited us to spend a week with them. And so we came to Rome. Now, up to this point, Paul has really not seen any really familiar faces. Right? He's been surrounded by people that do not believe the things that he believed. And frankly, many of them wanted to persecute him for those things. And so now he comes to this point, here at the end of verse, verse 14, where he finally sees a familiar face. Isn't it nice to see a familiar face after you've been on a long journey? I mean, if you do any kind of traveling and maybe you come home to see your family, you might understand how that feels. I remember one particular 
particular time, and I've done a lot of traveling for, for different reasons in the military and what, but there was this one time that I was training in South Texas for the Air Force, and this actually, what transpired during that time was 9-11. And so, many of you remember 9-11 for my generation, this is a, one of the, the, the most pivotal events that, that happened and certainly continues. Worst attack on our country since um, uh, Pearl Harbor, which initiated World War II, by the way. And so this was a, 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 a frightening event that happened in our history, it actually catapulted us into several wars. Many of people, many people died in those wars, which is what we, so what we memorialize even on this weekend. But for me at that time, I thought, I just need to get home. Because although I knew the people around me, they weren't my family. They were my brothers and sisters in arms, but they weren't my family. And so I never remember that homecoming when I came home, well, probably about 30 days later. And I remember just coming and seeing my wife, and I remember coming and seeing you know, the kids, and it was just like, and everybody had their cars decorated with like, there was tremendous patriotism, right? And it was just like, man, these, this, these were my people. And I got home and I just felt such an incredible, incredible peace because I saw familiar Faces, right? This is how Paul would have felt. Like, I know these people. They get me. They understand me. Isn't it great? Isn't it great that Paul was meeting and being encouraged by other believers? Isn't it great that we can almost be assured that Paul was likely encouraging them as well? If we know anything about Paul as we read about him in Scripture. Think about all of the lives that the Apostle Paul touched and the people he met on the detours in his life. Those things which he did not intend to do, but the lives that were changed because he embraced them. Verse 15. Verse 15 says this. The brothers and sisters in Rome had heard we were coming, and they came out to meet us at the Forum on the Appian Way. Others joined us at three taverns. When Paul saw them, he was encouraged, and he thanked God. So let me finish. Oh, we went too far. Can you go back? Can we do that? Okay. So here's where we're at. So they set sail from Malta with their new provisions. They're in Syracuse and Regnum up to Patuli. There's the Appian Way, right? These are Roman roads that go in. Three taverns. This is another one. Eventually they get to their destination. Their destination there in Rome. Okay, we can go back to, to uh, our scripture. So He's on this course, and, you know, he could have at any time, gosh, I don't know, he could have prayed that God would take him a different route, that he would do something different. You know, clearly, this was not the, the, the easiest thing for them to go through, a very difficult travel, but he stayed the course. When you stay the course that God puts you on, it won't always be easy. We see that. That's by example here in Scripture. Most of the disciples... Right? All the apostles, everything that happens. It's not always easy. This is important if you're a new Christian. If you are a new believer in Christ, understand that it's not always easy. It isn't. It's not always easy, but if you embrace sometimes the detours that God takes you in your life, he will create opportunity for you. If you're open to it, he'll create opportunity and show to, to help you share the power of the Holy Spirit and the love that comes by being in a relationship with Jesus. We can share this with other people, even in the detours of our life. And I know when you're not feeling close to God, the last thing you want to do is talk to other people about God. But guess what? That's exactly what God would have us do. That's exactly what Jesus would have us do, and that's exactly what the Spirit is leading us to do. Paul's relationship with Jesus, it reflected in his relationship with others. I can't imagine that this man did not have a big old Christian grin on his face every time he greeted somebody. I can only imagine the embrace of the Apostle Paul as he had the love of God filling up inside of him, and he just emanated it out to the people around him. You know that we have that same power within each of us. We have that same ability to bring joy into people's lives by sharing God with others, just like the Apostle Paul did. 
Paul was following, or he was being led by the Holy Spirit of God, and he knew that God was giving the directions. First message point is this. The Holy Spirit, right, on this Pentecost Sunday, I would like to declare to you that the Holy Spirit is your GPS. He is your God-positional sensor. You cannot turn your location services off for God. He, he knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly where you've been. He knows exactly where you're going. And he knows intimately every detour that may come. He has intimate knowledge of the destination because he lives there, if you're a believer. But he also knows all the detours that it's going to take to get there. God is not an annoying voice. He's not an annoying voice that is always telling you to come on, suck it up, read your Bible, pray more, press on, proceed to the root. That's not God. That's not the God we serve, although those are instructions. But it is what he wants us to do. He wants us, and he always gets us where we need to go. He always does, and he looks to bring us into contact with people and giving us opportunities to share the joy of knowing, uh, knowing that as believers in Jesus, that God has a future and God has a hope for us. He has a future and a hope. You need to know this even in the most difficult detours in your life. And I know, because I've talked to some of you, there's some challenging ones. But even in those most difficult detours of life, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm, harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. A hope and a future. This is the hope that, that the Apostle Paul had. This is the hope that we can have. This was a promise to the people of Israel that there would be a hope for them out of captivity. There would be a hope for them in the future. But God's promises are the same yesterday, today, and always the same promises. That means that promise for them is the same promise for us. And so we stand knowing that we have a hope and a future in Jesus. This is essential. It's essential to finding joy, realizing that God is the ultimate GPS. And although at times we may wander, at, at times we may uh, be on detours, we will never be lost. Never be lost. Verse 17. Verse 17 says this. Three days after Paul's arrival... He called together local Jewish leaders. He said to them, Brothers, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Roman government, even though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our ancestors. The Romans uh, tried me and wanted to release me, but they, because they found no cause for the death sentence. But when the Jewish leaders protested the decision, I felt it necessary to appeal to Caesar, even though... Uh, I had no desire to press charges against you, my own people. I asked you to come here today so I could get acquainted, uh, excuse me, so we, could, so we could get acquainted, and so I could explain to you that I am bound with this chain because I believe that the hope of Israel, the Messiah, has already come. So apparently he's, he's got a chain. Maybe he's shaking it or something like that. But this is the visual if you want to get it. Verse 21, they replied, we have no letters from Judea or reports against you from anyone who has come here. But we want to hear what you believe. For the only thing we know about this movement is that it is denounced everywhere. So, the time was set. And on that day, a large number of people came to Paul's lodging. He explained and testified about the kingdom of God and tried to persuade them about Jesus from the scriptures. Using the law of Moses and the books of the prophets, he spoke to them from morning until evening. Here's the culmination of this journey. Here's the culmination of the journey. Finally, he is doing what he set out to do. He is preaching in Rome, the capital of influence. And so he calls these Jewish leaders together in this area that he's been given. He's under house arrest there in Rome. And he calls these Jewish leaders to this house, and he preaches his heart out. He tells them about the gospel. He tells them about Jesus, and everyone gets saved. 
Well, that's not exactly what happens. Verse 24 says this. Some were persuaded by the things he said, but others, they did not. Others did not believe. Second message point is this. Your journey is unique to you. Not everyone will understand it. Not everyone will understand it. Everyone comes to the knowledge of God in their own time. You cannot force a relationship with Jesus on someone. Parents, listen to me. Cannot force a relationship with Jesus on your children. You pray for them. You minister to them. You guide them. You discipline them if necessary. But just like anybody else, they will come in God's time. There is no one-size-fits-all program for becoming a Christian. We may be standing in the same place. We're all sitting in the same auditorium. But, but if I were to turn on your, your God positional sensor in relation to your faith, some of you would be, we would be all over the map in relation to our faith and where we started that and what age we were and where we were and what the circumstances were. We would just be all over the place because there's no particular starting point that is common for every person in their faith journey with God. And that's okay because the journey is unique to you. The experience is unique to you. For, for many followers of Jesus, and you'll go walk with the Lord long enough and read scripture long enough, for many followers of Jesus, this is a huge problem because it comes to the point where we so deeply know the truth that we want people to believe it. And we somehow think if we can do enough, they're going to believe this. They're going to become <coughs> believers in Jesus. And we want to somehow control a movement of the Holy Spirit. God help us if we think we can do that. We certainly can't. This is not your job. I want this to be liberating to you today. This is not your job. It's God's job. It's God's job, and frankly, it's his will. And it can be faith-killing for you if you walk that way long enough. It is God's job. It is the Holy Spirit's job to bring people to the understanding. And we go, why don't people come to church? Why don't people you know, accept this incredible free gift of salvation? How come they don't? Well, here's what Paul knew. Paul knew that his job was conversation. And he knew that it was God's, through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, to direct people to convict their hearts to believe on Jesus for conversion. So there's a difference. Conversation, that's our job. Conversion, that's God's job. Does that help you? Conversation is our job. Conversion is God's. Verse 25. And after they had argued back and forth among themselves, they left with this final word from Paul. The Holy Spirit was right when he said to your ancestors through Isaiah the prophet, Go, say to this people, when you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hard and their ears cannot hear. For they have closed their eyes so their eyes cannot see and their ears cannot hear and their hearts cannot understand and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. So I want you to know this. Salvation from God has also been offered to the Gentiles and they will accept it. They will accept it. Paul knew that you would not always, he had experienced this, you would not always see immediately the results of your obedience to God. It may be discouraging for a time. Certainly he went through times of discouragement. But when you find yourself not understanding why God isn't fixing things, and he just doesn't snap his fingers and put everything back right, understand that maybe he is and you just don't see it, or you just don't see it yet. Third and final point is this. Stay on the route that God has prepared for you by staying focused on Jesus. Can it be that little annoying voice for you? Proceed to the root. Proceed to the root. We have a choice. 
We have a choice on the journey that God gives us. We can be discouraged by the detours, or we can be encouraged by keeping our eyes on Jesus. I'm going to share this scripture with you. Hebrews 11, 1 through 2, which many people believe the Apostle Paul wrote. It says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of, cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders uh, and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. You realize Paul, the apostle, was rejected? I mean, this is Paul. He was rejected more than he was accepted. But he knew that that following Jesus wasn't a sprint. It was a marathon. He knew it was a long, it was a long journey. And it had a lot of twists and turns. But as long as he had breath in his lungs, he was going to preach the gospel. Not just to anyone, but to everyone. And he was going to let God work out the details. He was just going to carry out his responsibility. Here's some details of what Paul accomplished while he was in Rome. He continued to preach to the Jews. Some accepted the gospel message. Some became believers in Jesus. He preached to the Gentiles in the same way. Some accepted. Many accepted the gospel. Many became believers in Jesus. He probably converted a guard or two along the way because they were watching him day and night. You can imagine that this gospel message, as powerful as it is, and coming from an anointed Preacher like Paul, you can imagine that this permeated their hearts. These guards were the chief guards in the house of Caesar. This is Caesar who is the, the end-all, be-all of leaders of the ancient world. So here is Paul, the, the, the missionary of all missionaries in the first ecclesia, the church of Acts. And he now has an audience by, by default, if you will, with Caesar. Amazing. Amazing what God does to propagate his word in the way that he wants. The Bible says this in Acts 28, verse 30. It says, for the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. And it finishes by saying, no one tried to stop him. No one dared to try and stop him. Paul embraced his detours. He embraced his detours and he put his faith in Jesus. He was led by the Spirit and he trusted God for the results. When you put your foundation in Jesus and you are led by this incredible gift of the Spirit, listen, God will always go before you and he will make your path straight. Amen? Would you pray with me? God, we come to you today and we thank you, God. We thank you for this incredible book, this book of Acts, this writings that are inspired by the Holy Spirit, that were written down by your chosen instruments, God. We thank you so much for the wisdom that you've given us in and through the model that you've given us for our local church, God, and for the church as a whole. May we continue to walk in and 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 believe in the things that you have done in the past, that you will continue to do those things again, that your church is an eternal church, God, that we know that no matter what forces stand against us, that no matter what detours the enemy tries to take us on, that you will always be steadfast within each and every one of us that have called on the name of your son, Jesus Christ. God, we thank you so much for that incredible gift. God, we thank you on this Pentecost Sunday that you poured out your spirit onto the people of this earth that, be, that are believers in Jesus. And because of that relationship, God, you have given us this gift of the spirit, that same spirit poured out in the upper room in Jerusalem as the same spirit that is inside each and every one of us as believers. God, we pray today that you would continue to pour out your spirit on us, that you would continue to pour out your spirit on our community, that you would continue to pour out your spirit on our nation, that you would continue to pour out your spirit on this world, God. And we thank you so much for preparing a place for us, God, because we know when we're done here, we're going to stand before you, and we pray, God, that you will simply say, well done. Well done, my good and 
and faithful followers. Well done, my good and faithful servants of Jesus. If you're here today and you have never started that faith journey, and, and, and you, you, you've heard me talking about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit speaks into your life and convicts your heart. And the way that works is the Holy Spirit convicts you of the things that are just not lining up with God. And it's an opportunity because the Holy Spirit points to the Savior, and that is Jesus. And so if that's you today, and you're realizing that there's some things that you need to give over to the Lord, whether you're watching online or you're sitting here in person, it doesn't matter. Just simply say, Lord Jesus, I take all of these things, we call them sins, and I give them to you at the foot of the Calvary's cross. Thank you for dying and shedding your blood for me. Thank you for giving me the freedom from sin and death and allowing me to live eternally with God in heaven. If that's you, you made that decision. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. If that's you, you become a part of the great grand family of God, and we want to welcome you home. God, we love you. God, we praise you. In Jesus.